Hey everyone, welcome back to Here in Apologetics. I'm so pumped to join us today. So I have Dr. Brian Miller. He's a research coordinator for the Center of Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute. He holds a BS in physics with a minor in engineering from MIT and a PhD in physics from Duke University. He's done a lot of work in the intelligent design movement. And today we're talking about the new book, God's Grandeur, The Catholic Case for Intelligent Design. So Brian, thank you so much for joining me. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well. I just came back from a long tour in Africa, so I'm readjusting to our time schedule. Yeah, I know. You told me how early it was for you as you were recording this. And I was like, oh my goodness. Like, I can't imagine doing an interview at like 530 in the morning. I'm just like, whew, it's a lot. But I guess the jet lag probably helps you a bit with that. Yeah, it's perfectly fine for where my body clock is at the moment. Awesome. Um, so let's talk about like intelligent design and everything. So to start off, Brian, do you want to talk a little bit like it's your first time on the podcast about like who you are and what you do before we get rolling? Certainly. So um, I have, a, as you mentioned in my biography, I have a, a bachelor's in physics with engineering, and I have a PhD in what's called complex systems physics. And what's happened over the last several years is I've been involved with the uh, what's referred to as the Intelligent Design Research Program. And uh, that's a group of scholars that are examining the evidence of nature from the perspective of design where we're both identifying the evidence for design and showing how the design framework helps you to do better science, make better predictions, do more productive research. And I'm now the research coordinator for the Center for Science and Culture through the Discovery Institute. And I help to coordinate research around the globe of researchers who are promoting this, um, this research program. So that's who I am. Yeah, that's super cool. And I love what you're doing. Um... In the intelligent design movement, I think is just a very, like, even if you don't agree with it, a very interesting and important case, because like, I just finished reading a few weeks or months ago, uh, the return of the gods hypothesis by Stephen Meyer. And like what you hear about, about intelligent design, even, even from like popularizers on like the Christian side, uh, and most certainly on like the people that are critics of the movement is very different. Like what you hear that case is than like when I actually just like read it and I'm like, oh, like it's actually like, I see what, I see what Meyer's doing right here. Um, so I'd encourage people like to take this movement seriously, even if you don't agree with it, read the literature um, and don't just listen to podcasts like this, because there's a lot of stuff happening here. Um, and it's super interesting to think about. Yeah. And I actually was uh, the head research coordinator for that book. So I was helping Dr. Meyer go through the technical literature related to cosmology. Wow, that's super cool. So let's talk about this book, God's Grandeur. Uh, you talk about some of like the recent developments for the case of intelligent design um, in this book. Do you want to talk a little bit like overview, like what is this book all about? And like, mm -hmm. what are some of these recent developments in the intelligent design conversation? Oh, certainly. So what's happened in the last several decades is people that have been working within the intelligent design community have been doing both popular level research and more academically research, but it tended to uh, be read and heard more within Protestant circles. And then obviously internationally with like Muslims and Orthodox Jews and other people like that. Um, but the person who was the pioneer behind the book is Ann Gager, and she is a convert to Catholicism. And she really wanted to present the design arguments uh, to the Catholic community. Now, almost everything in the book would be uh, completely relevant to people in other, from other backgrounds. But still, the Catholic world is a little bit more sensitive to the beliefs of the early church leaders, people like uh, Irenaeus, um, people like Aquinas. So the book also has sections that deal with that. And what it does is it presents out the overarching case for design, uh, both from um, a scientific perspective and from a philosophical theological perspective. So it talks about some of the latest evidence that points to design in biology and cosmology related to the studies of the minimally complex cells. And then it also shows how this belief that we see clear evidence of design in nature, uh, in every aspect of nature, from the laws of physics to biology to the design of our planet, is something that was supported and promoted by pretty much all Christian thinkers for the first 1700 years, or at least 1600 years of the church. Uh, so we're kind of making that case. And also we're showing how if you deny design that God directly ensured that life would look the way it does, and instead argue that we are the product of a blind, undirected process that may not have had, a, had us in mind, then that undermines the most fundamental Christian teaching. It also undermines uh, virtually every aspect of theology, since theology focuses on the good, the true, and the beautiful, and the materialist evolutionary framework, as it's understood in the, in the secular academy, undermines um, ethics, it undermines human value, and it undermines the very idea of beauty. 
Okay, that's very helpful, Brian. So, like, I just want to draw, like, one distinction here. Uh, you talked about, like, criticizing, like, this, like, materialistic, like, evolutionary framework where yeah. she takes God out of the picture. Um, is very, like, it seems like a very unchristian view. Um, what about, like, a Christian view of, like, evolution? Because I know that, like, in the Catholic Church, sure. um, there's, in, in Protestant circles as well, there's this big debate about, like, can we make sense of, like, an evolution, evolutionary model under, like, a Christian theism? Like, what do you, how do you guys make sense of that? Um, is it talked about in the book? Yes, absolutely. It's focused a lot about that. And some of the major, we talk about some of the major leaders that are trying to promote this idea. And I have to say that people that do that are very sincere. They have the best motivations. Um, they feel that the scientific evidence for evolution is, is, is decisive. So they feel like for Christianity to survive, it has to accommodate evolution in its theology. Uh, the challenge, though, is one, that understanding of the science is now clearly inaccurate. And two, what happens is when you do try to synthesize uh, evolution with Christianity, it creates a foundation that cannot sustain the Christian faith. So you have people like Ken Miller, who wrote the famous book, uh, Darwin's God. And in the book, he argues that from the evolutionary framework, he has to agree with the idea that we are happenstance of nature. We were not intended. We could just as easily have not been here. And this absolutely undermines this idea that we're creating God Im God's image as a direct act of his will for a divine purpose. Also, if you look at uh, ethics, what happens is so much of the theological and philosophical foundation of things like the sanctity of life, human value, the, the um, desire to be universally altruistic is founded on this idea that we're created by God in his image. While the evolutionary framework argues that we essentially came about through a struggle, a, a sort of survival of the fittest, of the most fit out competing the less fit. And that's why when the evolutionary framework uh, permeated Western culture, it directly led to things like social Darwinism, where colonizers in Africa would massacre large numbers of the natives uh, to take the land. And they felt that that was good because it was simply the stronger members of the species out competing the weaker. So the attempts to reconcile evolution with Christianity are very sincere, I respect their efforts, but ultimately the way they have to do it is they have to jettison core Christian theology or they have to present evolution in a way which is inconsistent with how it's understood and taught in virtually all major secular universities. I was muted there. So that's my, my apologies. Um, so, okay. So I'm thinking about this, like, so there's maybe like a negative case where we're thinking about like uh, evolutionary theory and there's, there's maybe these problems with it and it leads to these consequences with like uh, things like social Darwinism and whatnot. But like, what about like the positive case? Like what are some of the like most powerful like reasons or arguments for intelligent design that you see, Brian? Yeah. And what's been exciting is I followed this debate since before you were born and if you look at the positive evidence for design today, it is vastly stronger than it would have been in like in the, in the uh, early 90s. And I'm working with researchers around the world who are making that case in ways that are much, much more rigorous. So for instance, if you were to talk to evolutionists back in, let's say, the 1970s, and you ask, what is the evidence that we are an accident of nature versus design? They would say that uh, the human genome, human DNA is filled with non-functional uh, nucleotides. It, most of G DNA is junk. Like they said, it was like 97% junk. They argued that life showed many examples of poor design. It looked like what's called the Rube Goldberg machine, where you have random pieces that come up about, came together in a haphazard, clumsy way to produce a function. Uh, they would say that um, the fossil record should show clear examples consistently of species appearing and then gradually changing into something different. All of these assumptions have been overturned. Uh, what's happened is if you look at the fossil record, the consistent pattern is things appear suddenly and do not change, which is consistent with design. If you look at the similarities in life, they do not fit within a consistent evolutionary tree where uh, two species which are closest related should share virtually everything in common more closely than a species that is very distantly related. The, the, tr the truth is the opposite of that. In fact, uh, there's a researcher named Winston Ewart who's in our circles who just published a paper in the Journal of Biocomplexity that shows if you look at similarities between species like echolocating whales and um, 
and uh, bats. They're not supposed to be evolutionary related, but they share very striking similarities in their genetic code and the overarching structure, which points to a designer who used similar design features uh, in order to accomplish similar goals. Uh, I've been working with biologists and engineers to publish papers, and we're in the process of publishing several papers over the next couple of years. And what we're showing, as well as others in the mainstream uh, research world, is that life shows what looks like a top-down design or a mind planned every detail of an organism in advance so that it'll be highly optimized. In fact, what you look at consistently is people have argued that, that nature shows poor design, like the eye is the photoreceptors face backwards instead of forwards. As science has developed, we've shown that that's actually the optimal design, that it's exquisitely designed. We've shown that uh, life shows the, the same design logic and design motifs as human engineering, reflecting the fact it was produced by a mind. Um, if you look at mathematical studies, uh, a couple of our researchers published a paper, I believe it was 2001, uh, in the journal, um, uh, theoretical, uh, the, the journal of Theoretical Biology, and they showed mathematically that if you look at the time scale in the fossil record in which major transformations take place, it's insufficient for more than, let's say, two or three specific targeted coordinated mutations. So if you look at the science, both on the critique of evolution and presenting a positive case for design, the evidence is consistently going with design, and uh, we're publishing papers to show that fact. Okay, so one thing that might be helpful here, Brian, and this totally, like, I don't, I don't want to say transform, but really help me understand, like, what's happening here when we're arguing for intelligent design is, like, the reasoning of, like, how are we going from, like, these systems to, like, actually, like, there being an intelligent designer. Uh, I'm thinking about, like, Meyer and this idea of, like, an abductive approach where we're looking for, like, mm -hmm. the best explanation and looking at, like, the explanations that we know of uh, to helping us trying to figure out, like, well, what can explain this. Can you talk a little bit about, like, the reasoning that gets us to intelligent design? Because some people, um, especially my friends that listen to this that are not Christians would think, oh, well, you're just pointing to these gaps in scientific knowledge, and you're just saying, oh, well, there must be a designer, because we don't know. Um, sure. What's the reasoning process here? Sure. And I think it'd be helpful if I sort of frame the discussion historically, because if you go back to, let's say, 500 BC, this debate about design and nature is pretty much the same debate we're having today. You had philosophers like Democritus, who was an atomist, and he would have been uh, an ancient scientific materialist, and he argued that everything we see in nature is simply the product of in, in, invisible atoms that interact according to rules, what we would call the laws of nature. And then those interaction of atoms, chance, and time would produce everything we see in nature. Uh, and the only reason it looks like it could have been designed is because there's essentially infinite amounts of time for random things to come together. And they were in debate with people like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, who believe that when you look at nature, you see uh, evidence of a mind that matter in of itself cannot produce, uh, cannot produce the order we see in life or other aspects of our world, but a mind conceived of that order in advance, and that mind ensured that matter was shaped in such a way to produce that pattern that was in a mind. And that, that's overly simplistic, but that's sort of a, a nice summary. Uh, so. The difference is if you are trained to see the world through modern Western philosophy, you're trained to see the world from the assumption that there is no design, that everything is the product of chance and time. So evolution is taken not as a scientific theory purely, but as a sacred creation narrative. It cannot be questioned. You cannot question the fact that life originated from natural processes. You can't question the fact that humans are just the product of random mutations, selective pressures, chance and time. Um, but if you don't start with that philosophical assumption, but you start asking the question, what do we see in nature that appears to be the product of natural processes, uh, like, the, like, for instance, a mountain produced by geological processes, versus do we see evidence of a design? Do we see a pattern that reflects a mind, like Mount Rushmore? Uh, we are open to wherever the evidence leads. So when you look at life, for instance, what you find is from a mathematical and a theoretical perspective, it's not possible for any natural incremental process to create the order in life we see in the very short time available in the fossil record. And I'm speaking relatively, it's like a few million years for the major transitions. But again, that's not enough even for, for more than a few mutations. Uh, versus you look at the, you ask the question, do we see positive evidence for design? design? And in life, we clearly do. So if you look at origin of life, for instance, and I've written about this. If you look at like the journal Inference, I had a nice exchange with uh, 
Jeremy England, who's a leader in the field. And what you find is every natural process will take living systems and break them apart and move them back towards simple chemicals. For simple chemicals on the early earth to become like a cell requires nature to do the opposite of whatever it ever, it ever does. In addition, when you look at the order of what's considered a minimally complex cell, that's a cell that's as simple as it can get without falling apart. We see very positive evidence of design. We see information code, encoded in DNA, much like you would encode in a computer program words into ones and zeros. We see information processing, energy production. We see motors that look very much like human motors, like the ATP synthase, but they're more exquisitely designed. We see evidence of a mind that created a hierarchical organizational pattern in the same way a mind who designs a car thinks about the whole car in advance and de designs each system to properly work with every other system. That's exactly what we see in life. Uh, what we see is a uh, consistently optimal design where the best design motifs human humans use are used in biology, but biology doesn't, does it better. We see control feedback loops. We, we see four bar linkages. So what happens is everything you'd expect to see in life, if it were designed, is what we see. And life looks the opposite of what you'd expect to see if it was produced by a blind, undirected process. That's kind of how the logic works. I think one of the things you said here that is very helpful, Brian, was like you're, you kept saying, we see this, we see this, we see this. Because I think a lot of people, and like I've been guilty of this a lot of times myself, when we're thinking of intelligent design, I'm thinking of people who are saying, oh, we don't see this, so it must be designed. But right. you're saying like, right. hey, like when we're going into biology, um, or you could say like physics or chemistry, it's about what we do see. We Like we do see these things that uh, give us uh, a resemblance of design. Like we see design, but it's even better than like even what humans can come mm -hmm. up with in a lot of these like systems and whatnot. Yeah, I think an analogy would be helpful. And it really uh, hones the part the, the, this point. Imagine that a spaceship crashed in Area 51 in the United States. And you have two groups of researchers that are studying this crashed spaceship. One group assumes it could not have been produced by aliens. It had to have been produced by natural processes. And the second group is open to the possibility that it was produced by an intelligent agent <clears throat> or agents. So the first group, they'd say, how do we understand the spaceship? Well, we have to come up with natural processes that can produce a spaceship. Perhaps there was volcanic eruptions that produced lava, and then somehow the metal in the lava separated and fell into the crevices of rocks that happened to be the same shape as spaceship parts. It uh, cooled into spaceship parts and tornadoes, volcan uh, volcanic eruptions, and wind moved all the spaceship parts together, rearranged it into a spaceship. Now, how far do you think that research program would go? How useful would it be? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, they would get nowhere. I mean, because that's just not what nature does. <clears throat> On the other hand, if you have the, the group of, of scientists who believe the spaceship is designed, what would they do? They would look at the overall design logic of the spaceship. <clears throat> they would see there's a navigation system, a propulsion system. They would see there was um, a shell to protect the spaceship from, from space. They would look at similarities in the spaceship with human design entities, and they would see control feedback loops. They would see metallurgy, et cetera, et cetera. So that perspective design would lead to a deeper understanding of the spaceship. It would lead to accurate predictions. While the assumption the spaceship was produced by natural processes would, would go nowhere. Now let's apply that to life. Uh, people that believe that life had to originate through natural processes have been working on this research for 70 years and have really gotten nowhere. You have like the Miller-Urey experiment where they produced a few amino acids, but every experiment that tries to mimic the conditions on the early earth accurately, and that's a key word, accurately, produces gunk, tar, asphalt. So any molecules that might be useful for life are embedded in a matrix of countless other molecules that are useless for life. The same is true if you look at the content of like meteors. Uh, and what happens is that's where all origin of life research ends right there, because it's a theoretical impossibility to extract just the molecules you need and then to put them together into things like RNA and DNA and proteins and to produce cell membranes. It just, it's not going to work. And if you look at every origin of life research <clears throat> um, paper that makes results, it's only makes results because the experimenters <clears throat> created very special protocols and experimental techniques to force molecules to produce what they wanted, <clears throat> like bringing nucleotides together in an RNA.
On the other hand, if you look at the research in biology, there's, an, there's a revolution taking place because more and more engineers are working with biology and that collaboration has forced the assumptions to change. Instead of assuming life looks badly designed, people now assume it's optimally designed. Instead of life looking nothing like human engineering, they see the same design patterns, the same motifs as engineers uh, use. So engineering and biology is what's advancing the field. It's what's giving understanding of the higher order um, design of life, while this assumption that life is produced by undirected processes has consistently led to, to inaccurate assumptions, inaccurate expectations, and has actually slowed the progress of biology because they were not looking for this overarching design that engineers know must exist. So that's just kind of, a, I think, an analogy and explanation of the difference. Yeah, that's super helpful. Thank you, Brian. Um, so we talked about a lot about design. What about like this idea of like transcendental like beauty? Um, there's a lot of like, things that seem designed. How do we see beauty and like how could that like point to God? That's a beautiful question because again, as I mentioned in theology, <clears throat> you have the idea of the good, the true, and the beautiful. And the idea of beauty, and I'm not a theologian or a philosopher, I'm more of a scientist, but let me just crudely explain this, <clears throat> is that from a theological perspective, beauty reflects the character and nature and purpose of God. It's transcendent. It, it, it resides in the mind of God. <clears throat> because God created us in his image, he created us to, in many ways, think his thoughts <clears throat> at a much lower level. We experience and understand beauty because God created us with this intuition of what beauty is. That's why if we see a beautiful sunset, we, we see things like um, the Sistine Chapel, we have a sense of awe, a sense of we're touching the character and nature of God. But in an evolutionary perspective, what happens is beauty is simply, our perception of beauty is completely relative. It's completely arbitrary, that we perceive something as beautiful simply because random mutations in the past with random selective pressures that drove the survival of certain organisms over another simply shaped our brain to uh, perceive beauty in a very subjective sense. So if a person, let's say, finds um, a, uh, the, the Michelangelo's works beautiful, uh, that's simply an accident of nature versus if a person sees, uh, let's say, severed body parts in a painting is beautiful. Again, that's also an accident of nature. And that might even be more beautiful in an evolutionary sense because it might allow us to have more food. So the idea of beauty completely collapses if you don't believe that we're created by a mind that created us with the ability to understand that transcendent reality. Mm, that's super helpful, Ryan. Um, one more thing I want to talk about here before we start to wrap up is this idea of like making sense of intelligent design in a Christian worldview. Um, so, I mean, a lot of people have different views about like the narrative of like creation and the Genesis debate and all that. Da, da, da. Um, and I know that like within the intelligent design community, there's a variety of different views of how, like, how to make sense of that. Um, so I'm just wondering here if like people that are thinking that about like, oh, well, like what, what's going on with intelligent design? How does that help you to like see it, like the Christian worldview, like more coherently, Brian? Like, does it just, is it just about the Genesis one debate? Is there more to it? Like, what are your thoughts here? Well, I'll just to give you my background is. Um, when I went to college, I started as a Christian, but after reading like Richard Dawkins' book, The Blind Watchmaker, um, after being confronted with, with uh, the truth of my faith, I my faith collapsed. And I was pretty convinced that atheism was true. God probably didn't exist. People were religious because they were naive and anti-intellectual. And what happened was I, I realized that that was problematic because if I was just an accident of nature, uh, then life has no meaning. It doesn't matter if I'm kind or cruel or happy or sad. I'll die. My memories will be gone. Eventually, the planet will die and all life will be extinct. So I said, God, I don't know if you exist, but you have to prove it to me. And what happened was God really answered that prayer because I said, if you prove it to me, I will serve you with all of my heart. And he honored that. And he led me to many different intellectual leaders in, uh, in science and philosophy and other fields. And what happened is the evidence of design and nature that I saw help bring me back to faith. So it, it, was, it was more complex journey. It was both intellectual and God, encountering God real, in, in personally. But what happens is the Christian faith is diametrically opposed to the secular narrative of the world. Because Christianity says we're created by God as an act of his will. Christianity says we are who we are because of God's intent. Um, the, the, that the world was originally created good. But because humans rebelled against God, that resulted in the fall, 
where we broke our relationship with God, nature, ourselves, and each other. And that's what's led to the degradation of the human soul in the human body. Uh, in the secular narrative is that everything is a product of natural processes, that life is not designed, it should be clumsy and suboptimal, and that there is no purpose, there is no meaning, there is no objective morality. And when you look at the evidence of design, that founds the Christian faith. Because when you see that the human body is optimally and exquisitely designed, that's consistent with the Christian worldview that we're created by God. When you see all the arguments that the human body looks badly designed collapse, that undermines one of the most basic assumptions of the secular worldview, because the evolutionary framework must produce bad design if it's going to increase in complexity. And there's a beautiful paper by David Snoke in the journal Complexity that talks about that. Um, if you look at the, the Christian framework, the idea is that the fall of humanity is through our broken relationship with God that results from rebellion. In the, in the secular narrative, the view is that every proclivity we have, every tendency, is simply a result of blind mutations and natural processes in the past. So it totally undermines the belief of the fall. If the materialist framework is true, we're simply going to die and cease to exist. Um, but if the Christian framework was true and we're designed by God, that means that when we die, we have faith and hope that he will resurrect our bodies as taught by Jesus Christ. So again, the ID perspective is completely consistent with the Christian framework, but the idea that we're an unintended accident of nature, as is explicitly taught in the evolutionary framework, completely undermines the foundation of our faith. Well, Brian, that's, that's super good and super helpful. Um, anything else you want to say about like intelligent design or God's grandeur or anything else before we start to wrap up here? Well, it's really important if you look in Romans that Paul um, Paul made this point very clear that God deliberately designed the world in such a way that we can see his character, his nature, his hand in creation. And when Paul wrote that, he was uh, engaging really the same debate we had today, because at the, at the time Paul wrote those le that letter to the church in Rome, you have the debate between the Stoics, who were descendants of Plato and Aristotle, they believed in design, versus the Epicureans, who were descendants of the Atomists. They argued that when you look at design in life, it's an illusion. It's simply a product of chance, time, a primitive form of natural selection, and evolution. In fact, evolution is not new. The ancient Greeks had it. And Paul was supporting the, the belief of design while he was challenging the, the, the belief of the Epicureans that we're an axe in nature. We just evolved. Uh, it, but Paul said people will suppress the truth. So it's important to realize that any society, any culture, any philosophical framework that denies a creator, that doesn't want to have the idea of a creator involved in their lives, will automatically embrace an evolutionary framework. And what will happen is the philosophical blinders and even the spiritual blinders, the principalities and powers of this world, will blind people from seeing the truth of design. In fact, talking to people, it's really fascinating. I remember talking to an atheist once, a freshman at Duke, and she was adamantly convinced that life was just an axe in nature. And I remember starting to talk with her, and I expected this to be a very long, protracted conversation. But what happened is she experienced almost like the, the Holy Spirit taking scales off her eyes. And she said, within a few minutes, everything you say makes sense. Uh, it, it was like God opened her mind. And what happens, and she became a Christian shortly after that for obvious reasons. Because what happens is the inability to see design in nature is interlinked with our spiritual blindness to God. And when the Holy Spirit opens our mind to God, at the same time, he'll often take away the intellectual blinders from the evidence of design. Because the evidence of design, particularly in biology, is indisputable. It's obvious. But what's happened is the secular philosophies of our world have blinded people to the truth. So if you are raised in a Western culture, every, um, every voice we hear is reinforcing the secular narrative that we're just, we're just a product of the blind forces of nature. And scientific education doesn't simply teach facts and figures and procedures. It is a religious a catechism or religious education in the philosophical framework of materialism. So what happens is people are socially conditioned to suppress the truth of design and they're trained to surrender their right to think critically about the evidence. They just accept the evolutionary framework as a faith commitment, as a, as a faith tradition. But what happens is when people break free from that philosophical framework, both the positive evidence for design and the implausibility of 
of natural processes explaining life becomes extremely clear. But to be able to see it, you have to work, for some of you that might be skeptical, you have to work to break free from your philosophical blinders. You can't just accept what you read on the internet or Wikipedia or on, on um, YouTube. You have to be diligent to study the evidence. Study the arguments for and against and counter argument after counter argument. And what you'll see eventually is that the critiques of intelligent design literature are based on ad hominem attacks, personal attacks, appeals to authority, misrepresentations of the arguments, misrepresentations of the people that present the arguments. And you'll find that the intelligence design community has responded to every critique and has made a rigorous case for design. But to see the truth, you have to diligently seek after it. So that's my encouragement. And I think that's a great encouragement for anyone to diligently just seek after the truth. Um, don't just trust what you read on Wikipedia or a video like this. Like actually go look at the evidence, go study everything and like really just go after it um, and use your own judgment. Don't just go off of what Zach says or what Brian says, but really study for yourself. Um, Brian, this has been so helpful. A great conversation. How can people like follow you, connect with you, um, purchase the book, God's Grand Door, things like that? Well, um, at God's Grandeur, you can just go to Amazon and and um, and look it up. And Ann Gager, again, is the editor. So look up Ann Gager and God's Grandeur. Uh, if you want more information about our work, you can go to intelligentdesign.org. That's intelligentdesign.org. That includes links to, links to the major websites like discovery.org has also pages with our research. Um, I'm, uh, I regularly contribute to a, um, a news site called Evolution News. Uh, and if you go to evolutionnews.org, I'm one of the authors. You can see my writing. And uh, that's a great way to get started. Well, Brian, thank you so much for coming on. Talk about God's green dirt, not grand door, as I was saying. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah this, has been, this has been a really great conversation. I've enjoyed it a lot. Um, encourage people to follow, connect with you, things like that. Uh, if you're new to here in projects, encourage you to subscribe, leave a like, all that fun stuff. And if you value what you do, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com. So should hear in a jog. Whoa, that was too much. Uh, if you value what we do, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash adhering apologetics. Your support would be huge. Brian, one last time, thank you so much for coming on today. It's been a great time. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm. Have a good one, everyone, and God bless. We'll catch you later.